Doesn't us being here now mean it never happened? After the release of Christopher Nolan's Tenet, many of the general audiences, including myself, have come out of their screenings baffled by what they saw. I think most of us are in agreement when I say that this is one of Christopher Nolan's most complex films, and it will take many of us multiple watches to fully unravel a clearer perspective. I have seen the film multiple times, and now that I've started to piece together a greater picture of the full puzzle, I thought it would be interesting to present it in a video. To put it more simply, I'm going to be explaining the plot and ending for Christopher Nolan's Tenet, in the aim to help you guys gather a greater sense of what actually happened. This analysis will also contain spoilers, so if you do happen to be someone who hasn't seen the film, then I would recommend watching this video after you've seen it. If you want to see more on the film, including video essays in the coming weeks, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoy this video, remember to give it a like rating. Without further ado, let's dive into Christopher Nolan's Tenet, Explained. So we knew going in that Christopher Nolan's latest film would be centred on John David Washington's protagonist, and that he's drawn into a battle for the entire world's survival, including something called Time Inversion. Nolan has made no secret of the fact that Tenet is his own take on a James Bond movie, so fittingly, the plot essentially boils down to a classic Bond movie setup. A villain wants to destroy the world for his own selfish reasons, and our hero needs to stop him, ideally with minutes to spare for full dramatic outcome. This is indeed Tenet, but the world in which that mission takes place in is more complex and unique than any you've seen in the Bond films, and maybe any other film altogether. Now, I won't pretend to be an expert on how Nolan uses physics, so this video won't be a concise deep dive into the science of the film, however, I will outline the plot and the general science of time inversion, as we, the audience, ideally need to understand it to a basic degree. It's important to note that, like the viewer, the protagonist does not have all of the information about his assignment, or indeed the situation he finds himself in at the start of the film. Tenet means a principle or a belief, which suggests that the protagonist has to simply believe in what he is doing and his duty, without the full facts. Time inversion is a key theme in the film, which means that time can run backwards, people and objects can be inverted, causing confusing scenes such as a bullet shooting back up into a gun, while an inverted person in the film can move backwards through time, and while the rest of the world is simply running forwards. We see some of this take place in the opening prologue scene, which unfolds at a national opera house in Ukraine, during a symphony concert, where terrorists infiltrate the hall and place everyone hostage. During this, a SWAT team subsequently invades the place and releases sleeping gas, putting the concert attendees asleep. Within this SWAT team, another small gang has been watching and waiting for them to invade. This team, led by John David Washington's character, dresses up as the fake SWAT team and blends in, placing fake badges over their arms. This is when a form of time inversion happens that results in the SWAT member being killed and one more fake member making an appearance. This one apparently is not from Washington's squad and has a red string attached to his bag. But as Washington rushes out with a hostage to the van after somewhat stopping a synchronised explosion, the duo are accosted by someone who is not meant to be a part of their team. The prologue ends and the protagonist is taken to a set of train tracks where he is tortured, which includes all of his teeth being pulled out, and in a brief moment of bravery, he decides to kill himself by taking a suicide pill instead of giving up his team. Turns out that this was just a test, and a mysterious individual played by Martin Donovan welcomes him to the afterlife, and arms him with a single word, Tenet. 
This leads into a new world which lays out a conversation with Clements Posier's scientist. She shows him that there are things that instead of moving naturally forward in time, are moving backwards in time, including bullets. The fear is that an inverted weapon from the future could affect their past, say a nuclear weapon. The protagonist eventually tracks these bullets to Andre Sator, played by Kenneth Branagh, and uses Sator's abused wife Kat, who was played by Elizabeth Debicki, to engineer a meeting in order to find out who Sator is working with. He promises Kat that he'll get back some fake arts that Sator is using to control her and her son. And at this point, she delivers a monologue about seeing a woman dive off the yacht as she returned, envying her freedom. The woman diving off the yacht is something that needs to be remembered, as later on in the film, this is revealed. It's also key to point out that Nolan makes Kat and her son the driving emotion behind the film. Now, although this isn't as emotional as some of his other projects, what the relationship provides is the idea of duty clouding the emotion and connection to family. The final shot of the movie can be a key piece of symbolism towards this, and I will relate to it at the end of this video. But along with the extra help of Neil, played by Robert Pattinson, the protagonist breaks into a freeport in Oslo. Before he can do that though, he gets into a fight with a mysterious inverted individual who eventually gets away. This is something we also have to remember. The protagonist still gets his meeting with Sator though, by telling him he can help get the plutonium he wants. Sator doesn't trust him and cuts him out, so the protagonist and Neil work to steal the plutonium before Sator can. A heist within a heist, if you will. Sator still comes out on top though, as he appears during the heist in an inverted car and threatens Kat's life to get the protagonist to give up the plutonium. It turns out that Sator's team have been doing a temporal pincer, moving forwards and backwards in time during the heist to ensure they know exactly how it will all go down. They do this through the use of a time still, sent from the future naturally, that allows Sator to invert himself but before he goes to get the plutonium from the past version of the protagonist, he shoots Cat with an inverted bullet. It's here when things get even more trippy. We see in the red and blue room sequence, which is one of my favourite in the film, that with characters moving back and forth through time, there is often more than one of each person in existence. To make things a bit clearer for viewers, those moving backward through time must wear a face mask to be able to breathe, which is one way to tell who is going backwards and who is going forwards in the film. An example is when we see the protagonist with Cat on a stretcher enter one of the door portals and come through to the other side, only to look across and see that side is now in reverse with themselves because that's how it appears from the opposite perspective. But coming back to the plot, we witness a military unit show up, led by Ives, who is played by Aaron Taylor Johnson, and it's revealed that Neil has always known more than the protagonist and is part of the Tenet organisation. It's also revealed that Sator wasn't after plutonium, it was actually part of the algorithm that will change the world's entropy, effectively putting it in reverse. If Sator uses it, it likely means the end of civilization. It turns out that Sator is actually working for people in the future, where the world is so destroyed that they have no choice but to turn back. A scientist made this algorithm to reverse the flow of time, but to stop it being used, she split it into nine pieces and hid them in the past. The nefarious people in the future recruited Sator in his youth when his hometown was destroyed by a nuclear blast, using him to find all nine pieces and bring them all back together. To stop Sator and to save Kat's life, the protagonist, Neil, Ives and their team invert themselves and start moving back in time. The protagonist is warned that he can meet his past self and he needs special breathing equipment as he is inverted, but the world is not. He's unable to stop Sator as the crashed car we saw earlier during the heist was actually his crashed car in his inverted pursuit. 
So to give Cat time to heal, they make their way to Oslo, as they know there's another one of the Time Still machines there. Knowing they can get in when they originally created the dive version. This is when it's revealed that the person the protagonist fought was actually his future self. Having gone through the machine at the free ports, they're now in the past, but moving forward through time normally. The problem is that Sator plans to activate the algorithm in the past. He's buried it in his former hometown under several bombs. It seems that when they explode, it'll activate the algorithm buried underneath them, changing the entropy of the world. It's at this point where Cat also reveals that Sator is dying of terminal cancer. So using his fitness tracker as essentially a dead man switch, he plans to kill himself on his luxurious yacht when he knows his past self isn't there, activating the algorithm to destroy the world. This is where we arrive at the climactic battle sequence in which the protagonist and a team of special operatives, including Neil and Ives, attempt to secure Sator's world-ending device. To do this, Ives concocts a temporal pincer movement in which a blue team of operatives will move through a turnstile to invert, aka move backwards from that point in time, to one hour before. They will experience what the red team will experience an hour before they do, meaning that they will then be able to brief them on what has happened or what will happen. This is where the film lives up to its title. As explained in the film, in 50 minutes time, the red team will work in tandem to prevent Sator's algorithm from activating before the blue team have to move back through the portal to return to a normal timeline. If it does activate, it will reverse the entropy of the world, which means the future ceases to exist. Because these two teams are working an hour apart, in 50 minutes they will both have 10 minutes to pull off the mission, the blue team moving backwards to their point of entry, the red team simply moving forwards to when the blue team entered. The two teams essentially have 10 minutes each, 10 moving forwards and 10 moving backwards in time to complete a mission, which is funnily enough reflected in the palindrome title Tenet. This is also something that Martin Donovan's character hints at with the gesture of merging hands in one of the opening scenes of the film. But as we witness, the mind-bending battle takes place with inverted explosions and visual perspectives from both teams. The long and short of it is that with Neil's help, the protagonist and Ives lift the algorithm in time, which is also down to luck, because during this, we continually cut to a tense scene between Kat and Sator. Kat has to head down to the yacht to stop Sator from killing himself before the crew succeed in their mission. After some acting from Kat to seduce Sator into this moment, she eventually decides to kill him in a state of revenge for her character's physical and emotional torture. As she does so, the team succeed in the nick of time by collecting the algorithm. It's also important to note that the woman which the past version of Kat saw jumping off the yacht when she returned on that day was actually her future self, after she had killed the future version of Sator. You see this briefly in the film earlier on, and at the time, Kat believed that this was another woman that Sator was seeing. But unfortunately, for the mission to succeed, the protagonist realises that Neil is killed when he goes backwards to help them. Once they've escaped with the algorithm, he tries to persuade Neil to not go back, but as he puts it, what's happened, happened. Before he goes though, Neil reveals that it's actually the protagonist who recruited him for Tenet, teasing that they'll get up to some stuff. We don't know exactly what, but what we do know is that one of the events saw Neil save the protagonist back at the opera, due to the fact that we see Neil's red string in the prologue. It's things that are in the protagonist's future, but Neil's past, as the whole Save the World mission has been a temporal pincer. Neil and others have been working back towards it, while others like the protagonist have been moving forward to it. And it was all set up in the future by the protagonist himself, along with, presumably, the Tenor organisation. It's the central concept of Tenor. This isn't a case of changing the past or future, everything has all been a part of the same loop. 
Sator was never likely to succeed in his mission because he never did. What we saw was in the moment events with extreme action and tension that all form part of this loop, just like the spinning tenant logo from the early marketing. Now whether it's a world in which things can be changed according to this loop, it remains to be seen. But then we finally come to the last scene. This takes place after they go back in time to Oslo and the protagonist tries to get Priya, the arms dealer who told his past self about Sator and the plutonium to not tell him about it so that Sator would never get his hands on the final algorithm piece. But at this point she refuses, so we don't know if that could have changed the events. In the final moments of the movie, however, the protagonist stops Priya from killing Kat to clear up loose ends, but he's only there because of something he told Kat in the past. Is that something that always happened, or did the protagonist alter the future by getting Kat to phone him if she ever thought she was in danger? It's certainly more straightforward for it to be a world where everything happens as it always has, even if you're not entirely clear about it at the time. As the protagonist puts it to Neil before they set off to stop Sator, doesn't us being here now mean it never happened? But we end the movie on a shot of Kat and her son holding hands, and walking off into the distance as the protagonist watches from within the car where he killed Priya. I think this ending can be a reference to duty versus family, but also the idea of living life against becoming trapped in a questionable reality. Kat and her child are basically moving on away from the threat of time, while the protagonist, being essentially the blank canvas for the audience to project on, is left looking on at this very question. It will be interesting to see how the audience reflects to this ending over time, but after a few watches, I must say the messages of it are growing on me. But that was my video explaining the plot and ending of Christopher Nolan's Tenet to the best I currently can. As a film that benefits on rewatch, I think it's great to do videos like this and see how everyone else experienced the film and what they gathered from it. I hope this did help some of you guys understand the events a bit better and I'm looking forward to hearing what else you picked out. So don't forget to let me know down below in the comment section. For more videos analysing Tenor over the next few weeks, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating. I will be doing a video essay on Tenet very soon, along with an updated ranked list of Christopher Nolan's movies, so make sure to keep a lookout for whenever I post these uploads. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it, I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.